Hey y'all, New Day, New Verses. We continue on into 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians. You know, last time we did this, we were picking up with verses 10 to 17, and I was reminded by a father in the spirit, or a spiritual father in the faith. There we go. Sorry, that sentence took me a second. A spiritual father in the faith that reading each, it's not just about the word, or the sentences, or the paragraphs, that each individual word brings a lot to it. And to go and slow down for a moment, and, and to really look at it. And as I was being convicted of it, I came back to Corinthians here, and God kind of showed me that today we're going to be going 13 through 19. And I'm really looking forward to digging into it because I've been playing with it a bit today and really looking at Isaiah and seeing some interesting things. So, Father God, I just, I put this before you as always, Lord. Put the words in my mouth that you have for the people who are listening, Lord God. Even if it's just for me watching it later, that whoever listens to this, get what you have for them, Lord God. Because your bread is better, Lord God. Your wine truer. Give us, fill us, Lord God. Because you said in the Deuteronomy that you referenced, you know, it's not bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, Lord, speak here in this place. Give me the words and don't let me get in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting at verse 13. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you, except Crispus and Gaius. For now no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech. For fear the cross of Christ would lose its power. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligent or the intelligence of the intelligent. You know, as I was going through here, I went back to that first the, the scripture reference, Isaiah twenty nine fourteen, and then the entire context of the scripture of, of chapter twenty nine of Isaiah. You know, taken in the whole, but that specific chapter, it's talking a lot about, you know, Jerusalem has become this altar of blood. And when a city is caked and cloaked in blood, it loses all sense of thought, all forms of morality, all function. It becomes lost in a wasteland desert. You know, it is a judge's period. In that day, Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You know, even though they had a king sitting on the throne of David, they were still doing what was right in their own eyes. And so, whether it was northern exile or northern exile of uh, exile of northern Israel by Assyria, or the exile of Judah by Babylon, when it became a nation drenched in blood, because remember, blood is life. You know that, that that was the idea of the atonement sacrifice, right? The blood washes over. That's why we talk about the blood of the Lamb washing away our sins. So this is a, a city that is steeped in the blood of the innocent. Those who are Hebrew kind of poor. Not just fiscally poor, but poor in spirit. Those who are the outside, the others of society, the unwanted, the unwelcomed. Silliness that we have such a thing when all are called and welcomed by God. I think the, the foolishness that it feels to those headed for destruction are those who choose it. Yes, there are some that do. And those still who don't choose it but are lost. And those are the ones I think are, need to be reached out to most. The ones who don't know the truth of how loved they are. You know, we, we really don't walk that out. And, and we see this here right here. Christ's been divided into factions. Not a chance. But we do it. We, we other each other. You know, oh, well, you're not part of my clan. You're not part of my faction. You're not part of my group. You're an other. You go over there. But we do that all the time. You know, one of my friends was reminding me of the, in certain regions of the South, the Presbyterian versus Baptist showdown. 
or the, um, for me, it was the um, Presbyterian versus Lutheran. Yeah, that one. Or um, you see Lutheran versus Baptist. There's a whole little wave of why are you doing this that can be woven. You know, they don't like this for them reason. They don't like them for that reason. They don't. I thought we were called the love. Like I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be blunt on this one. Well, not really. I'm just hoping not to. Uh, you know, we're called the love. That, that's that's. <laughs> what is the most important commandment? To Shema, and to love others as you yourself are loved by God. If we're loving others as we're loved by God, then the petty crap goes away. Because it has to. Not because we're calling it petty, but because we're calling the behavior that destroys each other petty. If a discussion is to be had, then let it be had with kindness, compassion. Let it be had bearing the fruits of the Spirit. Kindness, goodness, peace, gentleness, self-control. That we would be able to hear each other's discussions, hear each other's arguments. You know, when I hear people about doing the splash thing in full, instead of the full dunking in the baptism, I did a, a cannonball into the baptismal, okay? I'm not going to judge anyone on that one because I'm well aware. Most people are like, what hedonism is that? No, 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 cannibal. And then was dunked by my pastor. I'm pretty sure I enjoyed it. But that's the thing. If you're splashing somebody with it, okay, what if you live in a region where water is scarce and it's showing the fact that you believe in the one true Lamb of God? And what if we have that discussion instead of hating each other? I mean, it's about here, right? If we, how did Romans put it well? How, or Paul in Romans put it well? If we confess with our tongue and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we shall be saved? If, if that's, that's, that's the bar. In here. And confessing. And Jesus Christ is Lord. If that is what it is to be saved, then why do we make people jump through hoops? That's religion. That's not relationship. Why do we other people, because they have different beliefs? That's not loving your brother. That's religion. That's creating another. That's behaving like the Levite, and behaving like the priest who walked past the man who had been mugged. No, we're called to behave like the Samaritan, the good Samaritan who helped the man, took him to an inn. But we don't do that. We act divided. And so we're carrying on this same tendency. We get into factionalism. You know, and let's be honest here. Let, let's be real, right? Calling on the carpet. And, and this is owning my share of it too. There was this huge push. It, you know, we see left, right, monkey see, monkey do. Secular world mimics the religious. Always has. Because religion lags behind faith. You know, the people who are blazing it out and chasing after God, they lead the path. And usually somebody like Paul had to deal with comes along trying to make their own way of it, their own buck at it, causes a lot of issues there, and then the secular follows. And we had this same issue, this rhyming nature, to factionalize. And so the secular world factionalized. And so othering people became second nature. Well, we don't have the same views on who the good politician. We don't have the same views on who president actually is. Or, or th does it matter? Does it matter? In that Jesus is the eternal king of kings, does it matter? No? Then why don't we love? My God is sovereign enough to fix what is wrong in me and get the log out of my own eye so that when I'm walking with my brother, he's dealing with their speck, not me. That if somebody I am in close relationship with has something that we're leaning on each other, being a brother's and sister's keeper and saying, hey, this look a little funky. Is something going on? Talking with each other, hearing each other, loving on each other. That's relationship. And justification in the Bible, the Hebrew idea, is being in right relationship with another. Being set right with God. 
Justifications for faith, righteousness, it's being in right relationship. You know, I heard it beautifully from Pastor Furtick that you know the cross, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's true because the entire point is everybody, all all mankind, equal. We are all his. Uh, what is it? Um, threat um, tz something. It, it, the image. We are all his image. Everyone, shade, color, shape, size, doesn't matter. Man, woman, child. We're his. And, and if we started living like we are all made in his image and he wants to have a relationship with all of us, then we'd love like it too. But sometimes I don't think we want that. Sometimes I think that as a body, we find it easier to say, well, but it's easier to other them. And yeah, it is easier to other people. It is easy to out of sight, out of mind, the hurting, the needy, the broken, the poor. But we're not called to do easy. We're called to do right. And right doesn't just stroll through life. Right sees the hurting and goes, helps. We're called to be the hands and feet. So let's do it. Because the world is always going to see it as foolishness if they're on the path to destruction. We live it, though? That foolishness, they shake something in them. You know, there's this beautiful image in the Bible project scene that's coming to my head where you know, there's this enemy soldier that's got a spear and about to stab a person through and threatening them. And instead of defending themselves, instead of fighting back, the person wraps the wound on the leg of the soldier. And that act of kindness shakes them up, starts making them think differently. Wait, why, why would you do this to me? You have no reason to do this to me. I'm your enemy. I'm threatening you. I'm out of my way to screw you. You have no reason to be kind to me. And the internal response when this truly gets in us is, no. But I didn't deserve any of the kindness he showed to me when he died for me. I didn't deserve it. Well, I was still dead in my sin and enjoying being dead in my sin. He died for me. He called me out of that foul place so that I could really live. And that's the whole point. His, the, the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent has turned most of society into the walking dead. We spend our time looking at our phones, wandering around like this, wandering into traffic because I have to be up to date on the latest tweet. I have to know what's going on. Oh, somebody tweeted. Oh, look, my Instagram updated. You know, Elon Musk says we're already cyborgs. I'd argue, I'd argue we're already in the middle of the zombie apocalypse. Because we're so busy looking at things instead of people. We're so busy looking at stuff that will fade instead of the lives in front of us. Lives that God has put in our path so that we can bless and they can bless us. Even if it's an iron sharpening iron moment. When it's a person where you're like, Wow, Lord, I knew you wanted me to be refined. I didn't know you wanted me to be that refined. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there a few times. But when we surrender it more, it gets easier. Because the whole point about being made into a new creation is that everything is new. The old self dies. Right? I die myself to me that I may live. Well, if we have to die to live, then why are we not okay leaving the stuff that should be dead, dead? The pettiness, the bitterness, the rage. You know, the slander, the hateful talk. Why are we leaving that stuff dead? You know, Jesus said that if you look at somebody who is angry, you've already committed a murder in your heart. Why don't we leave the anger in the grave? And, and I don't mean the, the, like, well, you can't be angry at all. No, I mean the hatred level anger. Paul said it well, be angry, don't sin. Because we get angry at the injustice. We don't hate the lost person who's causing it. Because we were that lost person causing it before we were called to light, to life. And if we're honest with ourselves, really honest, and remembering what the Bible says, 
even saved, we still wrestle with sin. If we said otherwise, we'd be calling God a liar. So there are still moments when we mess up, and God has grace for that too. Where it is purely about being perfected. Not being perfect, being perfected. Being made perfect. Because when we tell him that he is our king, that he is king over our lives, our master, our redeemer, when we give him our lives, he will settle for nothing less. Nothing. And when we do the uphill battles against his will, it hurts. Yeah. The harder the ego, the harder the break. I had to lose four inches to learn that one. So, <laughs> yeah. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> Six, three, five, eleven. I had to receive more concussions than I remember. At least according to my neurologist. Because I had to be broken to that point. Because I was stubborn. I didn't want to. I didn't want to surrender. I didn't want to learn. There were days when I wanted to go three rounds with God because I thought I could take him in a boxing match. <laughs> I was that kind of egotistical and dense. But that's the kind of foolishness of the world. That's the kind of foolishness we all have until he calls us to life. And so if we hate another person for having a moment of foolishness, are we not the unforgiving debtors? This isn't saying whitewash everything. This is saying love the sinner, hate the sin. Hate the real enemy, the evil, the destruction, the web of death left behind by our actions, by our missteps. By the fact that we are outside the garden of paradise and in a world of destruction and waste and toil. We're outside the garden and it hurts and it sucks and it's painful and we're waiting for paradise to come home. His kingdom come, his will be done. That is the prayer. So while we are in exile, while we are like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abel, and, uh, sorry, I'm getting, uh, Belshazzar is Daniel's name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the other three. You know, where are we going to live like the four of them did? The path of the exile, Jeremiah talks about living resolute, working for the benefit of the Babylon we're in, but not compromising. Walking that tension cord. That tension cord of hope. That tension cord of knowing that I am more than a conqueror because my God is more than a conqueror. Fear not, for I have conquered the world, is what he says as he leaves. Or as he's being crucified, I think. End of chapter 16, yes, crucified. But fear not, for I have conquered the world. And he's saying that as he's being crucified. He's conquered the world by love. By taking that penalty into himself. All of it. Yours, mine, ours, all of it. All who will surrender and call upon his name. I mean, he said it himself. He lays down his life for whom he wants. He can pick it back up. He lays it down for everyone. End of the game. Takes it back up. At least that's how I'm reading it. If you guys know more, I'd love to dig into it with you. Because I love learning on this stuff. I really love digging into it. And admittedly, some of the end time prophecies, I leave that stuff alone because it's way above my pay grade. If Jesus didn't get to know when the end time was, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> I'm going to worry about getting this understanding into me. I don't have to use clever speech. I can just be real. That is not about factionalism. It's about faith. That is not about how we are baptized. It's about being baptized in His name. The name of Yeshua, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's baptism, right? The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Take your pick on that last one, especially since its um, companion would be a closer one. From the Greek, anyway. You know, if we're baptized in His name, we believe in our hearts and declare with our mouths that Jesus Christ is King, then. You add communion, the Lord's Supper, the remembrance of his broken body and his shed blood, so that we would be set free. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment he bore, we are set free. So when we take the bread, we remember that we are free because he took the place. We are free because he died, so that we may live. 
who need drink the cup, we remember the blood poured out for us. Every precious drop poured out so that we may be in right standing with God Almighty and be able to walk and be welcomed into His presence in relationship. Those are the same three things that we all agree on, no matter your tribe function or ism. So can't we come back to that, what the first church had? Because if we're living with that kind of love and remembrance and belief and knowledge that he is actively here with us, that wherever we go, he is with us. We are not alone because he is with us. Even if we are lonely, we are not alone. Thank you, Jasmine, for that one. That was gorgeous. You know, because I felt it. I really did. He is always with us. Always. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And like they talked about last time, even the psalm that he begins with, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbat and I, it ends with all, all creation praising him. Not in the whole book. We broke it. God fixed it. And he used all of the breaks for our good and his glory. So that Paul can resoundingly say in faith what Joseph said. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Rome sending Paul to prison, yeah, meant for evil. But we wouldn't have any of these letters if not for that season. Not, at least not most of them. 1 Corinthians, this letter we call 2 Corinthians, which is technically the third. Any of that. We wouldn't have it without that. So it's about surrendering. Surrendering that what if this season is a valley season, but God is using it to refine me? This season is a mountaintop season, and God is using it to refill my lungs with air so I can breathe clearer. This season is a season when I can walk straight with the path level because the Lord has made it so, and I want to. Down the straight and narrow, the true way. Because remember, before Antioch, we were not Christians. It's a Jewish messianic movement following the way. Which I just love God doing that, because it's like the Mandalorian, this is the way, and God's like, yeah, no, I'm good. mine first. His is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If we live that, then even though it may be foolishness to those who are headed for destruction, maybe that foolishness will shake something up. I'm reminded of David. When they brought the ark in, he's dancing and celebrating and going wild, having a blast. That's the kind of revival I'm digging, you know? He's going wild with it. And his wife, Michael, looks down on him and says, Why are you doing such foolishness? And David's like, well, it's better that I praise than care what you think. And God's not too happy with her because she didn't end up having any kids from that point on. It just basically disappears. For a minute there. David celebrated with abundant joy because he knows how good God is. When we celebrate like that, when we live like that, when we love like that, yeah, we're going to be seen as foolishness by those headed to destruction. There will always be people in our lives, like David's wife, Michael, who, look, well, that's just it. What if, just as, you know, because we like to go down those what ifs, right? Here's a godly what if. What if we believed God is so sovereign that if we acted in foolish, abandoned, reckless love, same as he did, that he would knock down the giants, that he would smash the Jericho walls that have been put up by pain and heartache and brokenness? What if we believe that he could destroy the giant simply by using the stone he put in our hands, the muchness he put in our hands? Ah, there we go, first one. Most important commandment, right? Shema. We discussed that second one for a bit. Love your neighbor as yourself. First one, Shema. With all of your love, your intent, your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, all of it. Mind, body, and soul, or, or mind and soul would sum up just love. At least in the Western idea. Nefesh, your throat, your whole being. Your muchness, 
You know, oh, the thing God has given you, that blessing God has given you, that anointing God has given you, that calling God has given you. That, when he says, pointed at that enemy, and you do by listening to that still small voice, by being willing to listen, eyes to see what he has us to focus on, ears to hear what he has us to do, then what does it matter how big Goliath is? We don't come at him in the name of swinging sword or in any nation. We come at the enemy in the name of God Almighty. And so the serpent will fall. Because his head has already been crushed at cavalry. The walls will come crumbling down. The giants will topple. The fortresses of the enemy will be cast into the sea and the ground made level. Abundant forests made into fertile lands. Fertile lands made abundant for crops. God making everything new. What if we took a moment to say, our God really is that big. So I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you whether or not you deserve it, whether or not you've earned it, whether or not I even like you at that moment. I'm going to love you. And I'm going to agape love you. I'm going to love you in a way that says, I'm going to put aside me for a moment to see you. I'm going to put away the fact that I want to backhand you into June so I can see you. I'm going to put away the fact that I want to scream at the top of my lungs at how idiotic you're being so I can hear the pain that's causing you to do it. Because what we dismiss as others or morons are the lost. And if he's willing to leave the 99 to go get the one, why aren't we willing to love somebody who is rude to us? Why aren't we willing to forgive somebody who betrayed us? (laughs) I'm not saying it's an instant overnight thing in any way, shape, or form. Like I said, not an easy thing. Right, not easy, right. It takes time, and it takes surrender, and it takes an open heart, and it takes a willingness to learn. And it takes a sacrifice to love. But in doing so, we walk it out. So I'll leave you with this what if. What if we stopped dividing Christ into factions and pieces and started loving our fellow man like the Samaritan who saw a hurting person and paid so that they could rest up and heal? What if we loved so real, so true to his character that he is making and putting into us that we welcome others? And we see somebody labeled as other. We say friend. Let's let's see. Oh, 28 minutes. (laughs) I'll leave you this as just a quick joke. You know, my my fiance is Canadian and makes a joke about, you know, friend and buddy and pal and acquaintance and stuff like that. I never understood it. It was a complete culture shock for me. Because after all of my life, I've come to this resounding belief If they're not actively trying to knife you, they're a friend. Be it a spiritual knife, emotional knife, or physical knife. They're not trying to knife you. They're a friend. And I do believe it was Jesus who said, if they're not against you, they're for you. So why don't we start loving people? Because even if they're against us, there are more for us than against us. So we can live at peace. We can live in love. And we can live to bear the fruit that God has for us. In a place of sacrificial surrender. Where we lay down us and let him clothe us anew. Making us into new wine skins for his sweet wine. I will see you guys, God willing, next week when we pick up verse 20. I'm thinking what I might do is continue the Tuesday, Thursday, and then do shorts um, either Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, just as God gives it to me. Because, I mean, I could talk about this stuff forever, happily. (laughs) And the best part is, as a silly, stupid human trick, I can talk with it.